Salutations, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland, and behind me, there's that blue plaque. That's the house where Captain Lawrence Grace Oates lived. He of polar fame. So, uh, Captain Oates, my goodness, I don't recall his uh, precise year of birth, because as I say, I make a point of, of um, never looking things up before I, before I come on to do these videos. Born about 1880 um, in the United Kingdom, in England to be more precise. Uh, so he was uh, born in a very affluent family. Uh, he went to Eton, which is not too far west of here, about 15 miles to the west. Um, and there he was nicknamed Titus Oates because of the Popish plot. If you cast your mind back to the 1680s, there was this um, absolute rapscallion called Titus Oates who was brought up Protestant, who then uh, converted Catholicism, went to a Catholic seminary on the continent. Was it Dowie? Was it Belgium or France? Somewhere like that. And uh, he then came back to uh, Great Britain saying that he'd unmasked this um, plot uh, by Catholics and they were nefariously conspiring to overthrow the government um, in England, in Scotland, possibly in Ireland too. And they were going to slaughter all the um, staunch Protestants and obviously the weak-minded, callow people would be um, pressurised to convert to, to Romanism and all the rest of it. And so, so many uh, leading uh, Roman Catholic gentlemen were, were accused of high treason. And um, uh, Oliver Plunkett was the Archbishop of Armagh. He likewise was um, arrested in Ireland, brought to England, and um, uh, stood trial for his life on charge of high treason, and he executed, and blah, blah, blah. That's why it's the blessed Oliver Pl Plunkett. Anyway, and then people began to have doubts about this. It was sort of, it was sort of 17th century McCarthyism. So it was confusing well nigh everyone. Anyway, the, the, the thing was largely bull in the end. Uh, and that was that. So then he was, he was sent to the Tower of London, um, but uh, a release after a time, so disgraced. But uh, that, that story was much better known around you know the late 19th century than it is now. That's why Oates, because he had the sur same surname as Titus Oates, was nicknamed Titus Oates. But our Oates, the one who lived back there, when he left Eton, he went to the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, was commissioned um, into the army. I don't remember which regiment he, he was served in, but then he fought in South Africa. Uh, during the Second South African War, 1899 to 1902, more or less as soon as it was, it was commissioned. And he was wounded in the leg, but not too badly. Um, and there was a Royal Naval officer, Robert Falcon Scott, uh, who was fascinated by polar exploration. By, by the early 20th century, that's been the only region of the globe which hadn't been properly explored and mapped. And people were nibbling at the fringes of it as they were Americans, Norwegians, Britons, Russians, and so forth. And um, by about 1912, the only place that hadn't been uh, discovered or reached was the South Pole, which they knew must exist, the most southerly point on the globe. So Captain Scott, uh, he had the blessing from the Royal Navy and was given long leave to do this um, and tried to recruit people from all around the British Empire because it was meant to be an imperial expedition, not strictly a UK expedition. So Canadians, Australians, uh, New Zealanders and so forth were involved. Um, and that was that. And they put out a newspaper ad, and I don't remember the exact wording say about this polar expedition saying, you know, um, fearful cold, terrible rations, extreme endeavour, return doubtful, and that kind of thing. As bleak as can be, because he didn't want anyone who was a faint heart. He had to be absolutely committed, and he had to be willing to suffer. But nevertheless, he got thousands of applications. He sifted them through. Now, he chose Oates uh, for various reasons, okay? His physical hardihood and all the rest of it. He was young and fit, but also he was very wealthy, and he was willing to donate lots of money. Uh, in modern terms, well over £100,000 for the expedition. So they set off, and really the rest is history. So there were something like 30 of them in their base camp near the shore, and that was that. And then four of them led the, went, went on the actual assault all the way to the South Pole and back. But I won't limb here the many fatal mistakes that Scott made, but uh, using um, dogs, not, not uh, sorry, using ponies, not dogs, and things like that. Well, Roald Amundsen, the, the, the Norwegian, he used dogs, would shoot one of the dogs is lagging behind, eat it, feed any leftovers to the other hounds, and so forth. And he, could, he knew how to cope with the polar uh, conditions and the glacial temperatures, whereas um, the Britons were not so good at coping with these very gelid temperatures. Anyway, so they, uh, the British team consisted of four men for the final assault. Don't remember the names of the others, actually. But uh, as they were getting close, it was the um, Antarctic summer, of course, and they're getting there. The distance, what was that? What did they see? What was that dark shape? When they got closer, was it a red shape? fluttering the breeze, it was a Norwegian flag. Norway had beaten them to it. But anyway, they, they buried food on the way out and they retraced their steps and obviously collected the food as they went back. And how much food do you bring? Well, on his previous expeditions, Scott had always said, he kicked himself, I didn't take enough food. 
but at Swington roundabouts, the more food you take, the more calories you consume because of the weight and um, the other problems like um, uh, the slower you're going to be. The less food you take, yeah, you're faster, you're not burning so many calories, there's less of a margin of error. But anyway, he got it wrong. But uh, they all fell ill and he kept his diary. They're in their tent and they, there's like, imagine nerves were fraying. They really irked each other and he called it, he called Oats a cheery old pessimist. So imagine sharing a tent with someone you couldn't abide for months in these incredibly trying conditions like shrieking winds outside, minus 40, the gales blowing snow into your face and just nothing to see, snow blindness, monotonous diet, extreme physical exertion every day for months, such darkness, I don't know how they, they took it. But anyway, um, so he got ill with, I'm not sure, what was it, pneumonia, something wrong with his leg. He was slower, he was dragging the others down, they were having to slow down for him. So then one night in the tent, Oates famously said with um, really this sort of Olympian British reserve and stiff upper lip, um, I'm just going out for a short walk. I may be some time. And he never, went, never returned. He obviously went out to immolate himself for the glory of his country. He was gonna sacrifice himself. He was gonna deliberately kill himself, dying of exposure out there to give the others a chance because then they wouldn't be slowed down trying to trying to allow him to keep up with them. But um, so that was him. Uh, and obviously they all died. Scott died last of all. And in his, um, in his uh, notes he said, you know, um, if we had lived, what a tale of hardihood and fortitude everyone would have had to buoy them up. But um, um, our bones and these rough notes must tell the tale. But also Scott was writing, surely our country wealth as it is will not allow our family to live in hardship because didn't want to be left in penury. In fact, his family were amply provided for. He was married, had one child, but that, that was that. Um, and so they were seen as a sort of heroic failure. Uh, even though they've been beat by the Norwegians. On the other hand, becoming second in the world is not bad out of all the countries. And I say it was a British Empire expedition, but the four guys who actually went in the end, I think they were all from the United Kingdom, not elsewhere. Um, what else can I say? But you know, Scott, was he terrible? He got it wrong on the food. He chose the wrong crew, he didn't gel. Um, they came, they, they, they lost and they all died. So they either should have made it, you know, made it first, or they should have called it off earlier when it was clear they weren't gonna make it, or, you know, they weren't gonna, they were doing it at too high a risk of their lives. But he said things had come out against us and they didn't bear any grudges. They knew they did doing something very dangerous. They accepted the risk and they didn't blame anyone. They took the consequences. They knew what they're getting themselves in for, but that's Captain Oates. Um, and they, they were left where they were buried. Their bodies were all found very well preserved by the uh, very low temperatures. So that is Captain Oates, a figure, a figure who is now largely forgotten. All these lorries going behind, obscuring where he lived. Okay, this is Putney, the Putney area of London, where he lived. Okay, that's enough about Captain Oates. There's a little memorial to him at School Library at Eton.